Thank you very much. And continuing in this uh, theme of, uh, of uh, health officials, um, George Walden, uh, who is on the board of directors and vice chair of the Public Policy Committee of the National Coalition of STD Directors. And his day job is STD program manager at the Iowa Department of Public Health. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, Yes, I am here representing NCSD, the National Coalition of STD Directors, and it's an organization that supports STD programs across the United States, uh, including state, uh, government, state governmental agencies, cities, and a few territories. Much of the comp, uh, content that you'll see here are things that we've talked about at NCSD uh, through our various committees. Um, with the rise of, of more attention to this issue, in particular, uh, bringing up the federal STI plan. We've really thought through these things, so I, I think you'll see some commonalities here from some of the other uh, presentations that you've heard thus far. Um, but it really is intended to represent uh, our broader base of members. Uh, but since I am from Iowa Department of Public Health, I will sprinkle in a few local examples as well that I think um, kind of highlight the case. So I'm sure, as you all are aware, um, for the most part, um, we're talking about state and local level government, governmental agencies, and we're talking about STD prevention programs. Uh, one thing to kind of set the stage here is that we talk a lot about funding, and I think it's important to kind of put that in context, and I'll do that in a couple of instances here. But for over 15 years, we have not seen any net increase in available funding for STI prevention programs. And that's compounded by the fact that we've really seen a 40% loss in purchasing power during that time frame. So, you know, why do these things occur? You know, why aren't we seeing more support for STD prevention? A lot of what we've talked about already today. There's low public awareness, certainly not as many champions or advocacy as we've seen in some other fields, and extremely high stigma with sexuality. And I think that gets compounded when you talk about STIs on top of sexuality. It just reinforces the fact that without talking about these things, no attention is drawn to them, and that kind of silence um, fuels those epidemics. So um, talk about some opportunities here for improvement that we think can kind of move the needle on this. I'll admit these are kind of bigger, longer-term things. Other concepts here that we would need to work towards and iron out some very specific steps along the way. But um, as NCSD, we really feel like that these are things that could help us uh, move that needle forward a little bit. Uh, first, flexibility in funding. Um, we've seen that increase a bit over time, but I just want to emphasize how important that is. Um, I think uh, Dr. Boland said earlier today, if you've seen one STD program, you've seen one STD program. So with that, we have different local needs, and more than that, different local resources available to us. So uh, some STI programs may have additional support for staffing um, from other program areas, uh, and may lack support in support for testing or, or uh, STI specialty clinics or confidential services. So being able to really be flexible and adapt the needs at the local level are very important. But on the note of kind of clinical services, uh, screening, diagnosis, treatment, I think most of us or all of us in the room would agree that there really is no jurisdiction that has sufficient resources to really test and treat all individuals in need. And you know, relying on the state and local governments to, do, to step up and fill that gap, it's really not going to be enough. I think we've heard a number of times today that you know, one agency, one solution, it's just not going to be enough. We really need more, more to do, uh, more support than a single agency or government. You know, one possible way to address that, we've talked about today, um, providing incentives for localities. Um, some ideas are around that are trying to help us um, generate revenue by billing for services. I know that work's already being done, but it, it definitely could be, be ramped up. And an important thing to note here is, you know, we talk a lot about coverage and insurance, and that's a very key and, and core component, but we have to remember that uh, coverage in and of itself does not equal <coughs> access to service. So that even if we do get to a point where I put everyone, <laughs> because I don't know if it'll ever be everyone, but if everyone is truly covered by insurance, um, as long as stigma persists for STIs, we're still going to have those needs, uh, that need for confidential services. 
um, we're still going to need the specialty STI care um, clinics that try to deal with these things that are a little less common, uh, commonly seen in the primary care sector. And we have estimates out there, but we really need a complete, comprehensive, honest cost estimates for what it's really going to take to turn the tide on STIs in this country. And it'd be really helpful if we can develop some, some hard numbers that we could easily explain to decision makers and, policy, and um, policymakers so that we can take that to our local leaders and really try to show um, what could be done or at least where, where our end goal is to try to get there. Uh, so I think that's an area where we could really ramp up and, and use some improvement. I said I'd sprinkle in a little bit of Iowa. So this is just one example, um, and I'll explain this briefly. But it is one example, but I think this is a, a picture that you would see in many jurisdictions across the United States. So I just took um, our federal funding for STIs from 2013 to 2018 in the bars here. And then the line is our gonorrhea cases. So I mean, I could have done this for syphilis. I could have done this for um, chlamydia. You'd see something similar. Uh, I chose gonorrhea because you know, in Iowa and a lot of the US, we've seen pretty steep increases lately. And in Iowa, um, steeper increases for this particular infection. Um, but moreover, you know, when we're trying to prioritize what we're doing, uh, working more with syphilis, working more with HIV, it's quite frankly at the expense of gonorrhea because we only have so much manpower, so many resources. So this is one that you know, concerns me um, that maybe doesn't get highlighted quite as much because of those competing priorities. And the fact that you know, we are seeing uh, more co-infection around HIV. Um, I have some local data I could share at another time that um, shows uh, per persons newly diagnosed with HIV and um, very, recent H or very recent gonococcal infection, showing some biological factors there that um, really go to the point that STI prevention is HIV prevention. Uh, I'm going to touch on biomedical. Um, Obviously, we've seen a lot of revolutionary changes in some related fields, uh, and I think we need to have that be a goal for STI. Pointed out here, um, rapid testing for HIV, the medications um, that we have uh, with suppressing viral load now, and of course, what we've seen in the family planning sector with long-acting reversible contraceptives have really kind of moved those fields uh, forward in ways that we haven't seen in STI for quite some time. We need more support from industry, uh, trying to get some uh, incentives around that, really looking at patient-based, consumer-based test and treatment, really working towards addressing um, antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea, doing more, perhaps, with uh, PrEP for STIs. And of course, we've talked about vaccine and research development. I've listed some common STIs here, and I did um, throw herpes on there because that is one that, as was mentioned earlier, has a high amount of stigma associated with it. And quite frankly, I take more calls on that STI than I do any other. Informatics. STI surveillance, for the most part, is state-based. Uh, it all flows through state um, laws and governments and regulations. Really need to ramp up financial and technical support. Need some nationwide coordinated consistent efforts. And I think this really comes down to dynamic data systems. We've talked a lot about technology today. We need to ramp that up to really have it work for us in the STI field. We have a long way to go. Uh, and just kind of putting it on local jurisdictions, it's really it's not enough, um, especially the lower resourced ones. We struggle to kind of bring these on our own or acquire them or adapt them. It requires extensive IT support. Uh, so really getting serious about informatics, I think, uh, is going to help us understand what's going on. And I'll round it out here with, I put this all under the umbrella of primary prevention. We all know that condoms are a very effective way to reduce the risk of STIs. Uh, there are some, there's some great work being done out there with condom availability and distribution programs that I think we could ramp up. Uh, but really, I think what underlies all of this is stigma. We really need to attack the stigma associated with sexuality and STIs in particular and start that shift toward the sex positive narrative that we've heard about today. Um, we've heard about perhaps some national campaigns. Uh, that would normalize uh, STI testing and treatment, talk about sexual history taking. Uh, these are things that are out there, but they're just not really being utilized as much as they could be. And that education for youth, it's crucial uh, that we can start early and start um, youth to understand really what's going on with their bodies and 
empower them to be able to make some wise decisions as they grow older, as opposed to just them kind of figuring it out on their own from their peers. Coordination is going to be key with all of this. You know, we're seeing some a resurgent here, resurgence here of new initiatives at federal, state, and local levels. We've heard a bit about the federal STI plan. We'll hear more about the NAPA study. I've talked a bit about jurisdictional STD programs. Really having these kind of work in concert, and I hope that whatever plan comes out of this will really take all those into account and have a coordinated effort. Um, being a chief health strategist, I just uh, framed it here on STI prevention strategist. Similar idea, but really understanding the breadth of, of what's going on in our jurisdictions and throughout the country. And trying to do what we can to, you know, ideally not have to fill those gaps ourselves, but really um, work with other partners to make sure that those, all those gaps are addressed and filled. And I would encourage you, if you guys aren't familiar with your local STI programs or STD programs, to really get to know them, go out there, visit them, speak with the program managers, the STD directors. And if anybody wants to come to Des Moines, I'd be more than happy to have you out. Uh, it's going to be a little bit cold here pretty soon, so you might want to wait until the spring. But hey, it might be good for you to see some snow. Um, but we would, whether it's me or one of my counterparts in another jurisdiction, we would love the opportunity to get you more familiar with our programs, let you know where we're at, and give you some more thoughts about where we think um, we could move if we had some other partnerships and perhaps some other resources to help uh, springboard us forward. And so, thank you very much.